A good tevach, shavua tov. I'd like to thank the Heskians for opening their home, as they do very, very often. And the house should be only used for smochot and good things, and happy things, and good occasions. And that's the only thing that houses should be used for, besides raising kids. Which, that, I don't know how joyful that is. Uh, the joy comes when the grandkids, by the way, come. That's when the real joy comes. Anyway, topic tonight is, as I mentioned, it's Yutas Kislev, the 19th of Kislev, which was a few weeks ago, was the day that the, Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe was liberated from prison. And in a few days, I mean, the next week is Chavdal Tevis, the 24th of Tevis, which is the yard site, the passing of the Alter Rebbe. His name was Reb Shneir Zaman of Liadi. In our circles, we call him the Alter Rebbe because he was the first Chabad Rebbe. And one of the major books that he wrote was Shulchan Aruch Harav, the Shulchan Aruch that the Alter Rebbe wrote that we use. And he also wrote in Chassidic the Tanya. Tanya is, as we'll soon discuss what it is, but it's called... Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Tanya is what's called in by the previous Rebbe and the uh, previous Rebbe's also. Tanya is called the Torah about Bixav, basically the Chumash of Hasidic philosophy. Tanya is called the Chumash of, of, of Jewish of Chabad philosophy. We're going to get into that soon, why it's called time, why it's called Chumash Shabbat Shabbat and all the things. But to give a, b- a brief historical background. The Alter Rebbe, the B'Shem Zaman al was born in, I'm using the secular years, that we should understand it easier, in 1745. In 1745, the Alter Rebbe was born. At the age of 1764, 1764, mean when Dalt Rebbe was 19 years old, he was looking for a path in serving God. And he heard that there are two places, two central locations of Judaism. One was in Vilna, by the Vilna Garden, and one was in Mizrich, the city of Mizrich, where the Maggid of Mizrich lived. And he heard as follows, that in Vilna, you learn how to learn, and in Mizrich, you learn how to pray, how to daven. So the Alter Rebbe said to himself, a little bit, I know how to learn. At that time, he was super brilliant. At the age of 13, he said a discourse that all the scholars of his generation went crazy over. So he said, a little bit, I know how to learn. But to pray, I don't know how to pray. So let me go to Mizrich, to the Maggid of Mizrich. So the Alt Rebbe in 1764 came to the Maggid and became a disciple of the Maggid, who was a disciple of the saintly Baal Shem Tiv. So that was the Hasidic movement. And there was tremendous opposition against it because people thought it was another fake Mashiach, uh, another Jacob Frank or Shapsi Tzvi. And they were very hesitant. But the Alt Rebbe was actually, as we'll soon see, he held the fort of white Russia, which was the central point of the misnagdom of the opposition against Hasidus. And al Rebbe became the leader of that area. In 1770, that means al was 25 years old, the Maggid gave him a task to rewrite the Code of Jewish Law, not to change it, but to rewrite it and codify it and bring down all the issues that came up from the different opinions that happened historically until then. So the Altrebbe worked on the Shulchan Aruch. Tanya was print, published in 1797. Okay, that was when it was published. The Altrebbe though worked on Tanya for 20 years. 20 years the Altrebbe toiled on Tanya to the extent, as the story told, it's brought down by the Rebbes, that Somebody once came into the Alter Rebbe and they saw he was in deep meditation. And they asked him, what are you meditating about? So he says, it's six weeks already that I'm debating whether I should put an extra vav 
in a certain word of Tanya. Whether it should be Reishis Ho'avayda Ikra Veshosha or Ve'ikra Veshosha. And now Rebbe says, I'm debating already six weeks about this one letter. And, I, and, and he said, I'm still coming to the conclusion. And he said, for a letter in Tanya, it's worth thinking years and years and years. And so the, it took the Alt Rebbe 20 years to compile the book of Tanya. In 1777, before the Alt Rebbe wrote Tanya, there were students of the Magid that couldn't handle the fights, again, with the Misnagdim, who the opposition of the Hasidic movement, the torture and the bans and the fighting and everything. So they went, they, they went to Israel. It was Remendel Hardadokar with the other great students of the Magid. They decided and they picked themselves up to go to Israel, and Al Rebbe joined them. This is in 1777. This is 20 years before he wrote the Tanya, before he published the Tanya. And then, Al Rebbe on the way changed his mind. He came back. And then, many years later, in 1788, Remendel Hardadokar wrote a letter to the Al Rebbe saying, You must take over the leadership of the Chassidim in White Russia, which was the, again, the stronghold of the opposition. So that's the, the historical background of Tanya. When the Altrebbe wrote Tanya, why is Tanya called the Chumash of Hasidus? He said like this, there's five books in the Chumash. There are five books of Tanya. In the Tanya, it's divided into five parts. The Kote Amorim, Shai Yichud Vamuna, Igeris HaTshuva, Igeris HaKadosh, and Kuntu Sachrin. So these are the five parts of Tanya. Not only that, the first part of Tanya, the Alter Rebbe wrote 53 chapters. 53 chapters corresponds with the amount of Torah portions there are in the Torah. He also corresponds with the 53 days the Alter Rebbe was in prison for spreading Hasidic philosophy, so the Russians threw him into prison then. He was snitched upon that he's supporting Turkey, whatever it was, we're not going into that now. So the Alt Rebbe actually called Tanya, the Chassidah, the Rebbe's called it, the Torah Shebeksav of Chassidus. But what does that mean? It means very simple. You can learn Chumash, fifth, a first grader, five-year-old kid, learns Chumash, understands it. Beginning, God created heaven and earth, and God the earth with the empty and void. You can all learn the chumash. The kids learn it. They get 100 on the tests. The greatest of minds, at the same time, don't begin to understand the depth of the chumash. The first sentence, B'nai bar Lakim, you can learn, yeah, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. That's how a five year old kid learns it. But go into the sages of the Medrash and the Kabbalah, and uh, it's you can spend a lifetime and that one sentence in the beginning God created a heaven and earth and nobody will understand. It's very deep. And the same thing, it's interesting, the fifth Chabad Rebbe, whose name was Rebbe Rashab, said that our understanding of Tanya, this, the fifth Chabad Rebbe said this, our understanding of Tanya is like a goat looking at the moon. What the goat understands from the moon is what we understand of Tanya. So Tanya was called Ter Shebiksav because from one side, everybody can learn it, and that was, as we learned, everybody has to learn Tanya. And from the opposite side, as deep as you go into Tanya, you'll never come to the ultimate meeting and conception of what Tanya really is all about. Okay, now, in fact, Reb Zusha Anapoler, who was a very close friend of the Alter Rebbe, when they showed him the book of Tanya, he, they wanted him to write uh, what's called the Haskoma. In English, it's called approbation to the book. He looked at the book and he said, wow, how did this man take such a great God and put him into a little book? He said, how can this rabbi, Shneur Zalman, al how could he take such a great God and put him into this? Tanya is not a big book. It's a, it's a book, not big. How can he do that? But originally, the Alter Rebbe gave it out anonymously. It was printed in, in pamphlets. It wasn't printed in a book yet. 
And now the Rebbe didn't want people to know who it was because he wanted people to learn it and not to say, okay, it's from the Chassid, they don't want to learn it, whatever. So the Alt Rebbe gave it out. In fact, Tani is called, and the Alt Rebbe called it, the first part of Tanya is called Lukute Amorim. He didn't even take credit for writing it himself. He says, this is a gathering of sages, Mipi Safrim, Mipi Sfarim, Asafrim, which is the Rambam and the Rami Prague. It was, he never took credit for him itself, himself. Later on, there were so many mistakes, you know, copy after copy after copy. They never the Xerox machines those days, copy machines. It was hit, written by hand and people made mistakes. And not only that, the opposition to the Chassidim <coughs> falsified Tanya to show that it's going against Torah and it's going against what God is all about. And, and therefore, the Alt Rebbe finally agreed that it should be published. It was published, like we said, in the year 1797. 1797. And then the Tanya became famous. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about the book of Tanya in a general way, and then maybe we'll go into some details. The Tanya is based, it's called Tanya. By the way, why is it called Tanya? Because the opening statement of the book begins Tanya. Tanya, we mean we learned in a Braise, which is the same era of the Mishnah people, but it wasn't in the Mishnah, it's out of the Mishnah. And the reality is, that is not even a Braise. <laughs> if you look in the Gemara where the Alter Rebbe quotes it from, it's the Gemara at the end of, uh, the, end of the third parak of the Gemara Nida. Okay? To be a tzaddik and not, a, not to be a rush, that they're giving you an oath to be a tzaddik, not, it's not even a Braise. It's Rav Simloi. But the Rebbe used the word Tanya, the version of Tanya, because it says Tanya is the same letters as the word Eitan, Aleph Yud Tov Nun. Eitan is strength. Tanya is there to give strength to people and also to break a certain level of evil that's found in Torah scholars that's called Eitan, Eitan. And that, Alter Rebbe started the word, book Tanya with that word because he wanted to break that level of clip of that level of evil. But that's why it's called Tanya. Alter Rebbe didn't call it Tanya. Alter Rebbe wrote as the Kuti Amorim, at least the first part, a gathering of sayings. Also, if you look at the Tanya, a lot of times on top of the page, it says Sefer Shel Beninim. The book of the Beninim, and that we're going to get to later, discuss what is the Beninim, what is the book of Beninim, and so on. Okay, now... The opening pre-introduction to Tanya, the pre-introduction to Tanya, the Alter Rebbe writes like this. This book is based on a sentence in the Torah. What does the Pasuk say? Ki karev, it's at the end of Chumash Devarim. Ki karev elecha hadavar ma'od beficha ubovavcha la seisei. Which means, Kat Moshe Ben is speaking to the Jewish people. Ki karev elecha, it's very close. Hadavar, this thing of Torah, Ma'od, extremely, extremely close. Uh, beficha in your mouth, Bilvavcha in your heart, la asaysi to do, which represents thought, speech, and action. Right? Mouth is speech, heart is thought, and action is action. So the Alter Rebbe says, this whole book of mine is to explain what does it mean in the Torah? Korev, Elecha, Adavim, It's not only close and easy. It's very close and very easy for every single Jew to keep all of mitzvahs. Now, obviously, we know it ain't so easy. <clears throat> Far from easy. But we'll explain that soon. And then the Alter Rebbe adds a very interesting statement. I'm going to explain it. B'derech, Arucha, Uktsara. A long, short way. That's what he writes. I'm going to explain this in a long, short way. Simply, simply what it means is, the first 18 chapters explain it in great length, and then six, seven chapters explain it in a shorter way. So now that I've been right, I'm going to do it in a long, short way. But the real explanation is, it's based on the Gemara. There's a Gemara that says in native, and it says like this. That Yeshua ben Levi said, Rabbi Yeshua, 
Yeah, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi told, said, the famous sage Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi said, I was never, I never lost an argument. Except once with a kid and once with a woman. And three things, three things he says. The only arguments I ever lost was with a little kid and a woman and something else. Anyway, it doesn't matter. What was the argument with a kid? He was once coming to a city. It's famous Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. He was coming to a city. And there were a bunch of kids playing. So he saw two roads to the city. So he turned to the kids and said, hey guys, which is the quickest road to the city? So the kid said to him, the road on the right is long and short. The road on the left is short and long. <clears throat> so what did he do? He went on the short, long road. Very soon, he came to the outskirts of the city. The problem was, there were so many thorn bushes and so much vegetation, he couldn't continue going. So he came back to the kids, and they were still playing, and he said to them, what did you, he's saying here, what, what did you, drain me a cup, what did you make me crazy? The kids said, we told you the truth. In distance, the road on the left is shorter, but it's longer because you're not gonna be able to get there. And the other road is longer, but eventually it's shorter because you're gonna get there quicker. And now the Rebbe says the book of Tanya is based on the long, short way of Judaism, of Hasidic philosophy. <coughs> in the great Polish Hungarian Hasidim of yesteryear, okay, in the time of the Alter Rebbe and afterwards, there were very holy, great tzaddikim. And they had a very interesting custom. You might have heard about it. It's called Shirayim, leftover foods. These tzaddikim's relationship with their chassidim were as follows. The Rebbe would eat a meal, and then he would throw out food to his chassidim. And he would say, when he threw out the food, he would say, here's love of Hashem, here's fear of Hashem, here's this to serve Hashem. Basically, what that tzaddik's added, uh, way of serving God, which was a very holy way. He said, there's a pasuk that says, tzaddik v'amenose yichya. Simply it means a tzaddik in his faith lives. It means a tzaddik lives in, with faith. Now, the chassidim, the Polish Hungarian chassidim would translate it a little bit different. Tzaddik, bemunase. When you have belief and faith in the tzaddik, yichya, you will live. What they demanded, you need to have faith in your leader, in your rebbe. Once you have faith in your rebbe, he'll do it for you. He'll give you love, he'll give you fear, and that was a way of serving God. The Alter Rebbe came on the scene and said, you know what, that doesn't work in Chabad. It's not going to be the way of Chabad. Yes, you have to have belief in the tzaddik, and yes, the tzaddik gives you the strength and everything. But the Alter Rebbe says, you got to do it yourself. It's the long, short way. It's longer because you need to, Chabad means does intellect. You need to meditate. You need to learn. You need to study. You need to delve your mind deeply into something. It's longer. It's harder. But you know what? Eventually, you get there the right way. And if you're going to have the short, long way, Dr. Rebbe's philosophy of Chabad was, you're not going to get there eventually in the proper way. You might get there, but it's not going to be the proper way. So the Alter Rebbe based the whole Tanya, and this is what Chabad philosophy is all about. The other Chassidim, the other groups of Chassidim, were called Chagas Chassidim. Chagas stands for Chesed, Gvura, Teferis, which are the three basic elements of feelings, of Midot, of feelings, emotions. The Alter Rebbe's way of serving God was Chabad. What does Chabad mean? Chabad means ultimately, ultimately, the goal of every person of serving God is to have your hafta as Hashem alokecha to love God. To love God and fear God. When you love God and you fear God, then what you do, you enjoy doing. Okay? You enjoy doing it. If you're forced to do it, you don't enjoy it so much. So there's two ways of getting this love and fear. One is the tzaddik gives it to you and you're connected to the tzaddik. 
Or the Alter Rebbe said, no. You want to come to love and fear God? There's only one way of doing it. Properly. You have to create your intellect. Intellect, intellect stimulates your feelings. And then because the feelings are based after working of the intellect, then the feelings are real. They're not gifts that somebody gave you. It's what you accomplished on your own. You did it. And if you did it, then it's more internalized than if somebody else gave it, gave it to you. Okay, so now we have like this. Dalt Rebbe in Tanya, and this is a very unique thing, and we spoke about this many different times, when, when I say over Sichas of the Rebbe, or whatever it may be. Dalt Rebbe speaks in Tanya, the first part of Tanya, and basically the whole first part of Tanya, deals with the battle. And he gives the analogy, there's a city. And there are two kings fighting over control of the city. One, what do you mean control of the city? One king wants everybody should listen to him. And the other king wants everybody should listen to them. This is what the human being is composed of. We are a body, the city. And we have two kings within us. We have a Yetzir Tov. Nefesh or Lekis, the godly soul. And we have the animal soul, known as part of it, known as the Yetzirah, the evil inclination. There is, within each one of us, godly soul and animal soul. And this is the battle which is constantly going on within the person. There's a constant battle going on between good and bad. But what's unique and this is where Hasidus has a remarkable, unique concept. The animal soul which is within us is not bad. It's really good. It's not bad. The Yetz Sahara is not really bad. It's really good. In fact, the Gemara says, the Talmud says, the Yetz Sahara, the Satan, L'shem Shemaim Niskavnu, is really interested in serving God. But the, it's a very important concept to understand. There is no such thing as bad in the person. There are evil desires, but the soul itself is not evil. It's not a battle between the godly soul and the animal soul, perhaps, as good and bad, because the animal soul is workable with. You can work it, you can elevate it, you can refine it, and not only can you work it, refine it, you can transform it to a godly soul. Which is a remarkable concept. The battle that all of us have, this battle between good and bad, that we all always talk about, the battle within, the internal battle of good and bad, is not really between good and bad. It's between the godly soul and the animal soul. And the animal soul is not really bad. If you learn Tanya in the first page of uh, second, first chapter of Tanya, the Alter Rebbe says the animal soul of a Jew comes from Klipa Snaiga, which is a level of evil that has within it good, and that level of Klipa Snaiga, that evil that's workable, could be elevated. See, in, in Tanya, the Alter Rebbe says another remarkable thing. Yes, somebody in the street, good or bad. For instance, is an apple good or bad? I don't know. If you throw it at somebody, it's bad, I guess. But if you eat it, it's good. Hasidus comes along and says, no, that is bad. It's evil. Because in Tanya, he elaborates on this, and we can come how it's important in our daily life. In, in, Kabbal, in Hasidic philosophy, there's either holiness, and if it's not holy, it's evil. But not evil of a Webster dictionary definition of evil that's bad and we have to eradicate it and whatever. If it's not holy, it's evil. But there's a level of evil that you can elevate and there's a level of evil you cannot elevate. Things that are not kosher, like a pig. It's not kosher. If somebody will eat a pig, make a thousand brachas on it. Let's say a, a bracha shahak on a thousand times. And not only that, with the power of the pig that they ate, they'll go learn and daven and do mitzvahs. 
you never elevated the pig. It's total evil and that cannot be elevated. An apple is not holy. It's not holy, it's an apple. But it, that's a level of evil that the Torah permits. So therefore it's not total evil. It's an evil that could be elevated. And therefore if a person takes a kosher food, makes a bracha on it, utilizes it to be able to live like a Jew to serve God, they elevated that apple, in fact, Tanya Dalt Rebbe uses the expression, it makes it as great as a burnt offering, which was the holiest type of sacrifice in the temple. You elevate it to a state of ultimate holiness. So it's not evil in, in regular terms because God allows it. It's permitted. If it's permitted, we have the ability to elevate it. But until we elevate it, it's not holy. If it's not holy, by definition, in Kabbalah and Hasidus, it, then it's evil. But not evil like we call bad, you know, a murderer is bad. Okay, so we have the spiritual, the physical. The ultimate goal, and this is where the Alter Rebbe differed tremendously, and the Baal Shem Tev differed tremendously with the opponents. In the opponent's mind, was, which by the way, great, I'm talking about great holy tzaddikim. They just had a different philosophy. Their opinion was the body gets in the way of serving God. Because the body is, you know, corrupt, mundane, desires, who knows what. It's, it's, not, it's bad, it's not good. So therefore they maintained, and they lived like that, by the way, in order to serve God, we have to destroy the body. Fast, uh, roll naked in antives to get bitten. That's what they used to do, to get bitten up all over the place. They would torture themselves. They said, very simple, if I want to become close to God and my body gets in the way, what am I supposed to do? Break it. Let me get rid of the body. Break it. I, mean, I can't kill myself. That's forbidden. But I'm going to break it. I'm going to torture it. Then my body won't get in the way of serving God. The Baal Shem Tev, and even more expressed by the Al Rebbe in Tanya and other places, that's contrary to the whole Hasidic belief. According to the Hasidic belief, the body is not your real enemy. The body is only a vehicle to serve God. You can't do a mitzvah if you're sick. You can't serve God if you're dysfunctional. What you need to do, the Baal Shem Tev and al said, you need to work with the body, refine the body, refine the animal soul, and utilize the body and the animal soul together to serve God. In other words, it doesn't contradict. It's a joint effort. Because the animal soul of the Jew is not bad. It needs to be worked with and worked with elevate and to work with not only that but you elevate it. Now in Tanya, and this we're going to get to Sefer Shobainin and what's the Bainini, and this is a remarkable concept. Now Trebi speaks in Tanya, by the way, there's what we call the tzaddik. Now I'm not talking about a tzaddik in life is 75% you do good, 25% bad, you're a great tzaddik. You know, 51% good, 49% bad, you're a uh, mini tzaddik. Uh, you do uh, 49 good, 51 bad, you're a Russia. Now the Rebbe says no. And he gives a whole different concept. And this is remarkable how it applies. And therefore the book of Tanya is called Sefer Shobaininim. I'm going to explain to you what the Rebbe goes through a lot of chapters explaining what the tzaddik is and what the bainani is. A Bainani is not a person that kills his Yetzirah. He's not a person that destroys his evil. A Bainani is a person that never sins. Not in thought, not in speech, not in action. Goodbye. <laughs> a Bainani... Relax. A Bainani is... One who never sins in thought, speech, or action. Now, how could that be? By the way, it is possible. I mean, really hard. 
Nothing personal. Nobody in this room is a Bainani. Don't get upset. Nobody in the room is a Bainani. By the way, according to Tanya, you do one sin, you're wicked. You do tshuva, you become a Baal tshuva. But in, when you sin, or not only that, the fact that you do sin means you're not a Bainani. You're a Russia. But the book of Bainanim means every person, and it's a remarkable concept. And it's so real, it's hard, but it's real. Dr. Rebbe explains what is a Bainani. A Bainani, as we said, doesn't sin, not in thought, not in speech, and not in action. Now just keep a few things in mind which just logically make sense. There's nothing in Torah that God will give us that we can't do. There's a very famous Gemara in Avedi Zara, Eina Kodesh Baruch Ba Betronia in In simple English means, God does not demand from us something we can't do. It's pretty foolish of a parent or a teacher to demand something from a child that they're just not able to do it. You can't expect a one-year-old kid to tie his shoe, and when he doesn't, you're going to patch him. Well, God forbid. Hey, it's abuse. Uh, you're going to time out him. Okay? You can't ask, expect a one-year-old kid. You're not going to give a first grader uh, senior college uh, level work. I mean, and if you do, you're crazy. You can't demand from somebody something they can't do. If God demands from us to keep all 613 mitzvahs, by definition, God says you could do it. Because if you couldn't do it, not want. If you couldn't do it, I wouldn't give it to you. How can I ask you something that, that you can't do? So the fact that you're a Jew, and God gave us all 613 mitzvahs, which by the way, realistically speaking, there's some 200 something mitzvahs that we keep today. A lot of it has to do with the land of Israel. A lot of it has to do with the temple sacrifices, laws of purity and impurity that many of them don't apply to today. So something over 200 mitzvahs, practical mitzvahs that we keep today. The fact that God says you could do it, you should do it, you have to do it, means we could. Now, how is that possible? So al Rebbe uses four, word, four words in Tanya. And he says, because that's what a Benini is. You don't sin, not in thought, not in speech, not in action. Because a, thin, a sin in thought is a sin. You're not punishable for thought, except idol worshipping. But if a person has an evil thought, it's a sin. This world is not a, a thought-thinking world. It's a world of speech and action, so you're punished for words and action. But you can't get punished for words. Even, I mean, today, if I say I'm going to kill you, I can't be punished for that because I didn't kill you. If I kill you, God forbid, then you could punish me. If I say I'm going to kill you, you can't do anything to me. I can threaten, it's not going to do anything. But in concept, a sin in thought is a sin. In fact, according to Chassid, the Gemara says, and Chassidus elaborates on it, a, thought, a thoughtful sin is even worse than an action sin. It's a greater blemish on the soul, a sin in thought, than a sin in action. We'll leave that for later, maybe. Okay, so what does al Rebbe say? al Rebbe says four words, which are remarkable for human life in general. Moach shalit al halev. The mind controls the heart. And then he adds, this is beteva tul dosai, from the nature from birth. And he says that every human being, by the way, not only Jew, every human being has the ability as a human being for the mind to control the heart. And the only reason that mind doesn't control the heart because we don't want it to. But if a person wants to, then every person can control their heart. Now, sin comes from temptations, from desires that comes from the heart. Now, the Rebbe says in Tanya, it's possible, not that it's easy. We all know that it's not easy. But the fact is, the mind controls the heart. And if the mind controls the heart, Dr. Rebbe says, that is what a Bainini is. A Bainini doesn't sin because his mind controls the heart. I want to sin, but I understand it's no good for me. And if I understand it's no good for me, not only understand, I feel it's no good for me, then I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to do it. what's wrong. 
because it's wrong. And my mind is in control. By the way, if you're a human being by definition, the mind controls the heart. If you're an animal, there's only in, in, impulse. There's no instinct. There's no understanding. So then, of course, the heart desires control. <laughs> Somebody once came to the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Chabad Rebbe, and he told him, I have a cat that was trained with etiquette and manners and everything. So he brings the cat to the Rebbe and he's showing everybody how proper the cat is. And the Rebbe Rashab called over his secretary servant and he whispered something in his ears. Anyway, the guy left and a few minutes later he came back with something in his hand. And he lets it go, it was a mouse. And all of a sudden the cat forgot all its manners and everything, and it just chased the mouse. So he said, what do you mean you trained the mouse? An animal doesn't have this ability for mind to control heart. But a human being, any human being, Jew, non-Jew, it doesn't matter, has the ability as a human being to control the heart. And therefore, the definition of a tzaddik, though, is there's two levels of a tzaddik. One that kills his evil inclination, and one that transforms it to a godly soul. Okay? One that kills it, and the higher level of a tzaddik, what's called the complete tzaddik, is one who transforms it to a godly soul. And now you got two godly souls and no animal souls. That level of a tzaddik, you have to be born from God with that ability. Nobody, not a regular Jew cannot reach that. That's a level that God gives you as a gift from above that his, your soul was chosen to be a tzaddik. Which means, by the way, it's not automatically you're a tzaddik. The Talmud says, the greater the person, the greater is evil inclination from birth. Because everything has to be balanced. <laughs> if you have a greater soul, you have a greater evil inclination. So therefore, a tzaddik is born with a very powerful evil inclination, but simultaneously he's born with the ability to become a tzaddik, meaning either to kill it or to transform it to Gedusha. This is the ability that only a tzaddik can have. But a bainani, now Treb's book of Tanya is all about being a bainani. What does it mean being a bainani? Not to sin, not in thought, not in speech and action. I, it's impossible. He says it's not true. It is possible. You don't want to, maybe, but it's possible. Because a bainani doesn't have control over his evil inclination to kill it. Meaning, the bainani maybe wants to eat not kosher, but he won't. He'll want to think or speak something wrong, but he won't. The tzaddik, because he's so holy, never gets these evil desires or temptations or thought anyway. The bainani does get him. Because he has a yetzahara, he has a nefesh abamis, he has an animal soul. But nevertheless, he desires it, but he says to himself, no way. Now, for instance, Dr. Rebbe says, how can I control evil thoughts? Okay, I can shut my mouth and not talk. I can tie my hands behind my back and not do how can you control thoughts? If an evil thought comes... And the Bainini, by the way, evil thoughts are coming into his mind. The question is, what do you do with it? Do you invite it in for tea? The evil thought, do you invite it in, stick around for a while, let's drink tea together? Or do you get rid of it instantaneously? How can I get rid of an evil thought? Very simple. The Alter Rebbe says, by thinking a positive thought. You can't think two, th two thoughts at the same time. An evil thought enters my mind, I right away, as soon as I'm aware of it, I right away put a Torah thought. And immediately that's going to dispel the darkness of the evil thought. So the Bainini doesn't even have evil thoughts. Not because the evil thoughts are not coming into him, he just doesn't entertain them, he gets rid of them. He wants to do something, he wants to eat something that he shouldn't. Yeah, he wants to, and it's okay to want to eat it, the question is, do you or don't you? That's the Bainani. That's what Tanya is all about. And this is what Dr. Rebbe explains in the whole Tanya of Sefer Shishul Bainanim. And therefore he says like this, we don't need to be a tzaddik. And this is what Dr. Rebbe is explaining beautifully. 
you're not fighting evil. We're, we don't have evil within us. We have levels that could be refined and elevated and worked on. And that's what we need to do. A person is not bad. Freud said a person is mud. Right? That's what Freud's philosophy was. A person is evil. And according to Hasidic philosophy based on Rambam and earlier codifiers, a person is good. A person is good who has evil temptation, des- evil desires. But we have the ability to overcome them. We're not bad. People are good. They might have evil temptations. They might have evil desires. They might even do evil. But the Alter Rebbe said it doesn't matter. You are essentially good. It's not a fight within the person, good versus bad, that I have to eradicate the bad, kill the bad. No, he says that's not what it's all about. The battle of the person is dealing with feelings that might not be good, but you could deal with them. You can either get rid of them if they're bad, or you can elevate them if they're good. If they're bad, you can't elevate them, because bad can't be elevated. But you can get rid of it. And when you get rid of it, then you're a holy man. Because you, you did a mitzvah of getting rid of the evil thoughts. Are there any questions before? Oh, yeah. You said that if the Tanya is long, short, so 18 chapters long. That's the simple meaning, yeah. Seven chapters short, but that's only 25 chapters. I know, the rest goes into other things. Not about the exact Aruch uh, HaKtzara. What was the question? Uh, yes, in some way I said the first 18 chapters versus the uh, first 18, then the next, whatever, less than 18 chapters goes into the battle. But. No, Sefer Tzadikim. The Altrebbe wrote a Sefer Tzadikim, but he burnt it because he was told from heaven that it's not possible for the world. Yeah. Huh? It doesn't say when it was written because it's not discussed. Not discussed because Al Rebbe never wrote it. So uh, they didn't want from heaven to write it, that he should write it. So it didn't happen. And yeah? yeah? He said Homash is given by Hadush Baruch to Moshe. To us, through Moshe. Through Moshe. Are we claiming that Tanya was given from God to Alter Rebbe to give it to us? Chazal tell us, Kol ma shetal midvasik osid lechadesh kva nitna lemeshem isinai. Which means, anything that a proper student will come up with new was already given to Moshe at Sinai. When God gave Moshe Rabbeinu the Torah at Sinai, every aspect of Torah was given in a general form. Okay? When a person, and therefore it's a very interesting, the statement really contradicts itself. It says like this, It says, any new thing that a student, a Torah student will come up with was already given. Now if it was already given, how could it be new? And if it's new, how could it already be given? So the answer is, it was given, but in a general way, and this person brought it out from the general to the detail. Right? He brought it out from the potential to the... What? You're here? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. The pizza's here, Rafi. I'm waiting for you. Okay, I know that's what you came for. <laughs> um, so therefore, it was given by Hashem to Mesha ben Har Sinai. Everything of Torah, our sages tell us, have a time when it needs to be revealed. Everybody asks the question, if Hasidic philosophy is so important, why wasn't it given earlier? Why is it only 300 years old? Why not 1,000 years ago? Why wasn't it given then? And the answer is, every part of Torah has its time when it needs to be revealed. And therefore, before 300 years ago, so to speak, For the people to be proper serving God Jews, they didn't need Hasidus. But as generations went down in history, it's like 
There was never a cure for cancer before cancer was found, so to speak. Now that the, God forbid, cancer is found, so now you need to find a remedy. You don't need a remedy for cancer before cancer, right, or any other illness. You have an illness, then you need the remedy. The Altarebbe's book was written as a remedy for, and he says in the introduction, the Altarebbe says, I should have mentioned this before. The Altarebbe said like this, normally a book is limited. Books usually discuss this detail, that detail, this detail. The Altarebbe, in Tanya, the Altarebbe says, this book this, the, the, talks about and discusses the root of any possible spiritual dilemma. And Dr. Rebbe says, because I know all my Hasidim, I'm writing a book to answer all their spiritual dilemmas that they won't have to come to me anymore to ask me these questions. You'll find it in the book. And in the introduction of the book, Dr. Rebbe writes, and to the older, wiser Hasidim, I'm asking you not to have false humility. And if somebody comes to ask you their dilemma, and you could find it in the book, find it for them and tell them. So the book of Tanya basically is, spiritually speaking, is a remedy for all spiritual illnesses. And you'll find whatever you need in Tanya. So I'll give you a simple example. This four words that we said, mind controls the heart, you know how many issues that solves? Just think about, think about it. A lot of problems today exist because the mind is not controlling the heart. If the mind would control the heart, you eliminate a lot of spiritual issues and physical issues, by the way. So, but you have to find it. Just like you need to find Chumash, you need to understand it, you need to learn Tanya and understand it. But in Tanya, the Alter Rebbe answered all the questions. And it was given to Meshur Rabbein Har Sinai. Who revealed it down to us? The Alter Rebbe. He revealed Tanya. The Baal Shem Tev revealed the general Hasidic philosophy. The Alter Rebbe, two generations later, took it a step further into the intellectual understanding of godliness. That's what the Alter Rebbe accomplished in Tanya. And that's the basis of the Chabad philosophy is the book of Tanya. How the mind can control the heart? Because if the I know it's wrong, I say to myself, I'm not doing it. I can tell my heart what to do? Yeah. How? I'll tell him pump harder or lower. Or By the thin. way, ask any doctor that, that, uh, is, doctor that they don't know. Yeah, I know, they don't know anything. I know Dr. Dabur knows. Okay, they don't know anything. So, do you know, there's a famous story with the Chosid of the Alter Rebbe. Okay? A chassid of the Alter Rebbe, Ramesh Meisels, was sent as a spy. He was very brilliant. When the war went on between Russia and France, okay, there was a big dispute amongst the Jewish leaders who should win, France or Russia. A lot of leaders wanted France to win because if Napoleon won, he would be better physically for the Jews. But... If Russia won, it would have been better spiritually for the Jews. So the Alter Rebbe wanted Russia to win because it would be spiritually better for the Jews. So the Alter Rebbe, in fact, was saved by the Russians when he was running, when Napoleon went deep into Russia. The Alter Rebbe was running away from Napoleon and the Russian government helped him. So the Alter Rebbe had a chassid who was very brilliant, very worldly, and he knew languages and he was very sharp. The Alter Rebbe got him as a spy into Napoleon's camp. Instead of Meshe Meisel's. He was once sitting in Napoleon's camp, and they were sitting at a top secret meeting. Okay, and they were sitting in a room of, not Napoleon wasn't there yet, a bunch of advisors. And they were looking at war strategy for, with maps and everything. And Ramesh Meisel would listen and then report it back to the Alter Rebbe, who told it over to the Russian government. All of a sudden, Napoleon ran, ran into the room, and he was very smart, very short, but very smart. And he realized that this guy doesn't belong here. So what did he do? Without saying a word, Napoleon went over to this chassid and put his hand on his heart. Because if it would be a spy, he would be nervous, and then his heart would be beating faster, and he would know right away he's a spy. 
And Ramesh Meisel said, the Aleph base of Hasidic philosophy that he learned from the Alter Rebbe saved his life. He realized what was going on. His mind controlled the heart physically that it stopped beating with a big beat. You know, it, it, was, it, beat, it beat regularly. Okay? You, don't, you know how you tell your heart? When I want to do something wrong, I want to say something I shouldn't. My mind says, don't say it. It's wrong. We could do that. Yeah. You want to eat food and the food is no good for you? No. So if you go with your heart, you're going to eat. And if you're going to be an intellectual human being, you're going to say, you know what? This is not healthy. I'm not going to eat it. What do you mean you how the mind speaks to the heart? The mind controls the heart. If the heart controls the mind, we are subhuman. We're all subhuman. <laughs> so this is, we're all together. Don't worry about it. But technically, if you're human, the mind controls the heart. If you're subhuman, the heart controls the mind. See here? I have a question. Okay, so let's go.